Hello everyone. Um, let's do a mic check first, just to see that like sound and picture are working okay. Um, if you can just like type in the chat that you can hear me, um, just because we've had some problems with in the past. Um, it's annoying to get 15 minutes in and then uh, turns out no one could hear anything I said. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. So um, today we're gonna do something slightly different. So I. Um, I asked on Twitter what people would prefer to see, and it seemed like the overwhelming response was that you wanted to see some crate being built start to finish, um, sort of including all the steps in between. And so what I've decided to do is, um, this is a sort of neat little wrapper type um, that you can use for APIs that provide services that you want to be able to cancel. Uh, we can get back to an example with code a little bit later. Um, I want to point out that for many of these, I so I have a Patreon page where I post whenever I have, I, I have ideas for upcoming streams or if I want to solicit feedback from you who are watching this. Um, so feel free to reach out to me there or on Twitter and I'm happy to like take suggestions for upcoming streams as well. All right, so we are going to start a new crate um, and it's gonna be a library. And what are we gonna call it? It's gonna be called uh, Minion, and you will hopefully see why in not too long. So I'm going to do the same thing as I've done in past streams of starting out with an example, um, just because I think it's a really useful way to sort of structure the way your library API is going to look just by writing the code that would use it in advance. This is a little bit like test-driven development, except we're not actually writing a test. It's more that we're writing how we want the code to feel like, and then we can flesh out that implementation behind the scenes afterwards. Um, so we'll call it basic. Um, so the example we're going to write is going to be fairly simple. The general idea that you that, that this library is going to target is if you want to run some kind of a service in the background. So usually a service is something that looks like it has an infinite loop, and then it like fetch some work and then do some work and then it loops. So it just like sits in a loop and just keeps accepting more work and keeps doing it. The most traditional example of this, of course, is that you do something like uh, up here, you have a net TCP listener or something, uh, listener, bind, and whatever. It's not terribly important what this actually is, uh, but it's some kind of TCP stream. And if you have some kind of TCP stream, you then in a loop do, uh, this is gonna be listener. You do a listener dot accept, uh, probably with a question mark. And then you like do some work over the, uh, yeah, you did make it in time, well done. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the idea is that you loop, you accept some work, and then you do some work over that stream. So in this case, for example, you might, uh, if we wanted a very naive kind of library, it would do something like this, where it just spins off a new thread, and that's going to do some work on that stream. Right, so something like this you see pretty commonly in libraries. Um, it doesn't happen just for networks, like you can get this for inside you're like accepting work, like this is a worker pool, or it could be um, you are like piping a file or you're waiting on, you're like a web server that uh, has long running connections and you want to keep accepting more data from the client. Now, the problem with this particular pattern is what if, so imagine that this is some like run main loop or something. Like it's a function that you have somewhere in your library or in your program for that matter. Like you're running a web server and this is like your main handling loop. So if you have something like this, um, the issue comes with what if the user presses control C? So control C will terminate or should ideally terminate the current process. Now you could of course just kill that process, but ideally you want some nice way of shutting down. Let's say you have to close some database connections or something, right? So the question is, imagine that in main, what we did was we did some setup and then we call run main loop. Okay, great. But the problem here is how can we tell the main loop that we wanted to exit? Currently, there's no way for us to do that. Uh, Vim color scheme. Uh, this is a uh, base 16 Atelier Dune. Uh, my whole Vim config and stuff is on uh, GitHub under 
John who slash configs. So you can see it all there. Um, yeah, so if you have a program that looks a little bit like that, um, you now don't really have a way of canceling this main loop. Um, now there are a couple of ways you could uh, get around this. For example, you could have like, um, you could have while let stream is equal to that. Uh, and then in here, you could like pass in the listener here and then do some funky, you could like listener dot clone here. You spin up this in its own thread and then you like close the stream. It becomes really hairy very quickly. And we don't really want users to have to deal with this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write a wrapper type that's gonna allow people to have a, um, a neat way to cancel long running functions like this. Uh, and the basic way it's gonna look is uh, we're going to have a trait um, and that trait is going to be something like cancelable. Um, and if something is cancelable, all it has to implement is it has to implement a run method. That run method is going to take a um, essentially a pointer to a boolean. Um, we are going to have that be an atomic bool, I think, in this case. Uh, keep running. And it can return any type. Um, any error type. Um, and so that's all you should have to implement. I guess this is going to be, it's going to have some type error and it has to return self error. So the basic idea is that if you wanted to have your service be cancelable, you're going to implement this trait and this run method is going to be similar to our run main loop. Um, so you'd have something like impl cancelable for some foo type, you would implement run. And what you would do in the run method is you take this keep running, this atomic bool, and instead of just having a straight loop keyword, we're going to have something like while keep running, uh, I guess, uh, sync atomic, uh, we're going to have both atomic bool and ordering. Um, so while that boolean is true, so while keep running is true, then do what you used to be doing. So this, like so. So that's the basic interface. Like if you want something to be cancelable, you'll have to implement this run method and you'll have to take this atomic bool. And then in theory, what you should be able to do in main is you can either do something like um, let's say we have a foo here, um, and you could either do foo dot, uh, run here, let's say that was the name of one method. And what run here would do, notice that it takes no arguments, run here internally, what our library would do is it would call this, um, this run method with keep running always set to true. Sorry, always, yeah, always set to true. So it would never become false. And so the return type of, um, so for our trait, we're gonna provide a run here method um, that's going to return something like a result uh, never and self error, right? So this would be, if you want to run something on the current thread, um, then you can call this method. The exclamation mark here is this method will never return. Well, this, this type will never be returned. So in this case, what we're saying is that this method will only return if there's an error. Um, this is a pretty neat pattern. So we would use run here, something you can use if you want to execute on the current thread. And if you're executing it on the current thread, if you think about that for a second, um, there is no way for you to cancel something that's running on the current thread from the current thread, right? Because the, if this, the thread that calls this, so the, the main thread calls this method, enters this loop, and while it is in this loop, it has no way of also trying to cancel itself, right? So this is why run here would never return. Um, and so this method would just sort of end there. The other method we want to provide is something like, um, uh, run in background. Now run in background is going to have to return some kind of handle. 
and we'll figure out what that handle is later. Um, but the basic idea would be something like uh, if I did foo dot run in background over here, the handle that gets returned, what, what this will essentially do is it will spin up a new thread. So similar to what we had in the example code earlier, um, spin up a new thread that will run this, uh, this main loop, um, like just normally we'll just call this, this, uh, function, but then on handle, we're going to have two different methods. We're going to have h dot kill or maybe end unclear what it will be called. Um, and then we'll have h dot wait. And the idea is that h dot end is going to essentially set keep running to false internally. And that's going to cause the thread that we spun up that is executing this loop. Um, it's going to make that thread eventually exit. Uh, and wait is going to return result either nothing if it terminated correctly or self error. Um, yeah. So the idea here, of course, would be that in main, you would spin up the service that runs in the background. Then at some point, if you receive a command from the user, you would call h dot end, like you would, you would, um, you would call this function to say, I want the main loop to terminate, and then you would wait for it. Or alternatively, if you, um, you could, for example, have one thread that's like waiting for signals to exit. So we basically want H to be cloned. So if H is cloned, it means that um, we can give one handle to the thread that might terminate us because the user press control C or it detects that the moon is in the right face and so therefore the program should exit. Um, whereas in main, so that would mean that there's some thread spawn move, some thread spawn that might call H dot end. Whereas in main, uh, we will just call wait. So main is just going to spin up this, this uh, main loop and then it's going to wait for it. Does that roughly make sense? Uh, too bad the never type wasn't stabilized in 126. So the never type is nice, um, but I feel like exclamation mark works just as well, at least in this particular case, but never is a little bit nicer, I agree. Um, okay, so that's the basic setup. This example won't actually compile at the moment uh, and that's fine. It's more, I wanted to illustrate um, what it is that we're gonna, what we're targeting. Does the use case sort of make sense? Um, just before we start moving on to implementation. Great. Um, all right, so source lib, no tests yet. So we are going to need this trait. Um, there's of course some question of what we're going to call it. Um, cancelable is a sort of very trait like name. It's like a very rusty trait like name. Um, and I think that's what we'll stick with for now. Um, there are going to be some requirements of this. So run is just going to take this atomic pool. That's all we require of it. Run here runs on the current thread. Um, and it's going to be given, uh, oh, that's a good question. I think we're going to have it take a mute self. So this could technically consume self. Um, but I think we want to mute self because it might be that the user wants to restart the loop if something errors. Um, it's also unclear that run here is really the method what we want the method to be called, but run here doesn't actually, we're going to have to provide some implementation here. Um, run in background though is interesting. So let's call this something else. Let's call this spawn. Um, it also takes a mute. Ooh. Spawn in fact has to take a self. Um, because it's going to move the thing that we're going to run onto a different thread and we can't move a, a, um, a mute, mutable reference. I'm so used to the camera being there. So I keep looking there to talk. I should be like there. Um, however, if you want to spawn, then there are a couple of requirements for this, right? Um, so maybe over here. Um, specifically, the self type has to be send for that to work. If self is not send, then we can't send self to a different thread. We can't give away a reference to self, or in this case, the ownership of self to the thread that we spin up the main loop on. Um, in addition, 
we also require that self error is sent because otherwise we can't send the error back from the thread. Um, and so we will require both of those traits. Um, what is it complaining about? Can I find handle? Cannot. The exclamation type is experimental. Really? Oh, I'm not allowed to use it unless, oh, that's a bummer. I guess that's what you were referring to. Ah, uh, that's a bummer. Well, we can deal with that later. Um, let's open up a new shell to this Dominion. Cargo check. Uh, I guess we will use nightly for now then. It's a little bit sad, but I see what you were meaning by the never type. So to me, exclamation and never are sort of different because exclamation is already standardized. I just, it's only standardized as a normal return value. So you can do this, like that's fine, but using it as a type in here is what is referred to as a never type. So I guess that's the, that was the point you were making and you're totally right. Um, Right, so run here is just gonna take a mute self. It's gonna never return okay, because in theory, this, this main loop should never return. Mm. Uh, it's unclear whether we want to require that. Um, we might want to think about that. Um, okay, so we're gonna need this struct handle. It's gonna be a pub struct, and it's going to parameterize over the error type um, where error is sent. Um, and so that's going to contain some fields and on handle, I guess we don't technically need that. Um, and on handle, we're going to have two methods. Uh, so we want wait, which, uh, consumes the handle and returns a result that is either nothing because it, because the loop terminated successfully because it was, we told it to exit. Uh, or it returns the error. So that's going to require some implementation. And down here, we will also need a, I guess, terminate. We'll want this to be derived clone. That's probably going to come back to bite us. Um, and terminate is not going to return anything. It doesn't even have need to consume self. It can just be a ref self actually probably. And it will have to do something. So we want the user to be able to call terminate multiple times because who knows, there might be multiple user signals or so. Um, and calling terminate multiple times should not actually be a problem. It shouldn't even be an error. Um, because the it, uh, terminate is sort of an item potent operation, right? So if you call it once and then you call it again, it has the same meaning the first and the second time and calling it a second time doesn't change anything. All right, so that's gonna be the, the rough setup of our crate. Uh, we will also want deny missing docs um, because this is a library after all, uh, but I will comment that out just now for development. And this type will be public. Okay, so the basic idea that we have and that we've um, sort of talked about already is that we're going to have this atomic bool um, and that atomic bool is going to be the way in which the run method gets told when it should exit. Um, this means that the handle, so let's see, so run here is basically just gonna call self.run. There's very little more to it. Um, we do have to make an atomic bool, so in this case, uh, keep running is atomic bool uh, new true. It is going to call that keep running. Um, this is where we sort of have to uh, make a choice. So either we could have the result be the never type like here to say that the, the inner run method will never exit. Um, I guess we would do this. So we could totally have this be this, the method signature, but you can imagine that there are some there are some situations where the service might actually terminate normally as well. And there's a question of, do we want to support that use case or not? Mm. And I think the way to go here, in part because of the fact that the never type is nightly only, um, and in part because if you have something that is allowed to return, 
then the, the caller, so the main function that the user writes, could just wrap that in a loop if they wanted to, to keep on going even if it exited. So I think actually we will just want this, which is nice because it means that we don't need the never type anymore. Um, so this is just gonna call run with keep running. Okay, so run here is very straightforward, right? Because it's basically just calling the function. Um, we happen to know that keep running will never turn false in this case, um, but that's not something run does. Uh, we just want to have the, the user's domain should not need to have to call run with an argument itself. Um, in fact, maybe run here should be given a, um, a better name. Maybe this should be run and this should be like main loop or inner loop. Ooh, that's another question. So one thing we could do is we could also, um, I heard Rust is the future. It's true, it's true, you heard right. Um, so well, one option here is actually that we do the loop um, and just have the user give us a sort of the, the stuff that's inside of the loop. So if you think of our example, currently we have the user write this code right? Um, we could totally have that, that outer loop be something that we specify and then have the user just define what should happen on every iteration of the loop. Um, that's not a bad idea because that saves a bunch of boilerplate here, right? So this would go into like the, into foo new would contain this line, right? Uh, and then this method would now uh, would now just look like this, which is a lot nicer. I wouldn't even need to take this. So there's no reason to expose the fact that um, uh, there's no reason to even expose the fact that there's an atomic bool going on here. I like that. I think that's a lot nicer. Um, have them pass in a closure. I wasn't even thinking of having them pass in a closure. I was thinking of they just defined the um, the run method on the trait and we call, so instead of having this be run, we could call this like for each or something. Um, so this we will call uh, once for each iteration of the loop. Um, so like a loop body, right? It is a little bit weird um, of an interface just because like people won't be expecting expecting the code to look like this maybe. This, they sort of like to be able to manage the loop. So you could imagine something like, um, I might want my loop to be something like, uh, like I might, might want to terminate early if I get a particular byte from the client. Like if the client sends me a null byte, then I know that they finish and then I want to be able to return. Oh, okay, so here's, I think, the way to go with this. Um, we have, um, okay, so we have this be something like for each, um, and what we're gonna have it return is a uh, loop result. And this is gonna be parametric over E, and it will either be continue, or it will be break. So this is similar to um, a pattern that you also see um, in some other libraries, like in uh, the futures libraries, for example, um, you have this notion of a, a loop function. Um, so if you look at the futures, in fact, we can look at it right now. Um, in futures, um, I think it's in the new futures as well. So there is a loop function uh, which is basically a tail recursive loop. So it's pretty similar to what we're doing now, actually. And if you notice, it takes an initial state and a function to call in each time, and the function returns a, um, a loop thing, which is break or continue. And that's a similar thing to what we're gonna do, except that we don't have to deal with this being asynchronous. Um, so for us, the loop result is either just gonna be continue as in keep looping, um, or break because there was an error. And so now we can have for each, return a loop result uh, self error. Run is just going to be 
uh, it's going to be something like loop self dot for each. So for each is going to be given a self self dot. We're going to match on self dot for each. And if it's loop result uh, continue, then we continue. Um, I guess we can actually do if let loop result break with some error e, then we break with e. Um, yeah. Oh, I guess actually the, so uh, we could totally write the code this way. Um, it has the unfortunate downside that now there's no way for the user to exit without an error. Um, so the way we've written run now, um, they're basically forced to return an error, right? Because the break is parameterized over the error type and the only options they have are continue. Um, so I guess we could have, uh, we could have break and error. Um, and now we could have match self dot for each. And if we get a loop result continue, then we do nothing. If we get a loop result break, then we break. Um, and if we get a loop result uh, error with an E, then we return error E. Uh, now this is again a result this. I guess we could have break take an okay value too if we wanted to be really nice. Um, so we could have this take a output type and an error type. Run will return self output or self error. Uh, if we break, then we get some value here. Um, then we return with OKV, otherwise we return with error E. Right, so now uh, semicolon after the E. Uh, where? Um, yeah, so the, the idea now is the user defines a, uh, a function that we're going to call on each iteration of the loop, and they can choose to either continue break with a value or error out with some error value. Um, now, this is, if, if you followed sort of internal Rust development, you'll see that this is sort of similar to the way generators work, um, in that generators can choose to yield more value, values or say that they finished. Mm. And this is sort of like a, it's not quite a generator because we don't yield anything on every iteration. We just continue, um, but it's a similar kind of pattern. Okay, so run is just going to do this. Um, it's just going to run the thing on the local thread. <clears throat> spawn is where some of the additional complexity is going to come in. So for spawn, we need self to be sent. So we can send it to this uh, lookup result missing a parameter now. Yeah, you're right. This is self output. There's also the question of whether output and error should be associated types on cancelable. Um, I think that makes sense. I don't think there should be parameters of cancelable. So, so the, we could do this instead, but I think associated types are the way to go here. Um, let's see. Reminds me a bit of nom. Yeah, so this is also a little bit similar to how um, how you write a parser in nom, that you sort of either say that you successfully got some stuff, that you need more bytes, or that you failed to parse. Um, uh, you will see a lot of, there are a lot of programs, uh, not just in Rust, but in general, that end up with a type like this, um, where you basically want the user to be executing a loop, but you are, you are the, you as the library is the one implementing the loop. Um, Let's see. All right, so for spawn, we need to be able to send self. We need to be able to send the error. And we now need to be able to send the output. Um, and this is going to be self output. Um, so for spawn, this is going to be very, very similar. We're going to have to do something like get a new handle. Um, actually, 
not even true. We're going to have a keep running, which is going to be an atomic bowl. It is probably going to have to be under an arc because uh, we need both. Oh, that's a very long path. Uh, so we're going to need it to be under an arc because we need both the the thread that calls spawn and the the thread that we spin up to actually run the main loop to both have a reference to this atomic bool. One has to be able to write it, the other has to be able to read it. Um, and so therefore we're going to need an arc around this. So we're going to arc new this uh, and it's going to start out to be true. Then we will get a handle to the thread that we're going to join. So we are going to need standard thread. My Rust format isn't working. That's a little bit sad. Um, and we're going to do a thread spawn, move, and uh, yeah, we're going to need a copy of this. See, I really want a good way to clone into um, the clone into closures, because now I need to do this business, which is a little bit sad. There's a proposal somewhere. Uh, handwriting parsers from scratch. I mean, you can do that. You'll probably get it wrong. Um, okay, so in fact, oh, I wonder what happened to that. Um, so speaking of this issue so here notice how i want to i want to keep a i want to send a clone of keep running into thread spawn um but that is easier said than done uh, actually i think this is an rfc rfcs uh, involves. yeah this thing I proposed this a while ago. There's so many cases where you want to do this. And there's been a proposal for essentially having um, like clone all closures or closures that you can say should clone most of their arguments, but there hasn't really been a good solution yet. Um, so that's maybe something to watch. Anyway, uh, we are going to, so I guess we'll do this. So we need a handle to the thread that we spawn. And the reason for this is um, otherwise we don't have a good way of getting back the return value. So um, if you look at um, thread spawn, it returns what's known as a join handle. So this join handle business um, has a join method and that returns a ooh, thread result. So it returns a result where T is the return type of the closure that you gave to the thread when you started it. And so that's the way that we're gonna get back the, um, the break or error of the loop. Now, there's also an error to this, and this is something that a lot of people don't know. Um, and that is, if you call join, the result you get back, the error type of that result is, as it says here, the um, parameter given to panic inside of the thread. Um, and we might be able to take advantage of that here. It's a little unclear. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so this part is going to be essentially the same as this. Um, so I think this is just going to call self dot run uh, almost Arr, that's a little awkward it's not quite this because uh, mm, it actually has to be different uh, and specifically this is the whole point of the cancelable we want this to be while keep running Dot load is we need an ordering which is this. Uh, so we only want to keep uh, keep running while while the user hasn't tried to end the thread. Um, and of course, the question is then becomes what if the user tells us to exit? What are we going to return? Uh, that's actually a good question. Um, 
はあ、I think, okay, so, so the, the part that's tricky here is we need to distinguish this is because we added a,、um, a break value type. We need to be able to distinguish between the、um, for each breaking with a value. And the loop being terminated because the user asked us to terminate it. So I think actually we're gonna get rid of the break value、uh, for now. Because、um, I think it's fairly rare that these things need to return a value. And if you wanted to, you could just have it、uh, instead of break, you could return with an error.、Uh, so this would now break.、Um, This would be okay.、Uh, and now, now down here, if we ever get here, we just return with an okay. All right, so we now have a thread to the, to the join handle, and we're going to create a new handle that's going to have both keep running and the join handle. So it needs keep running so that it can.、Um, Tell the thread to stop executing. And it needs join handle so that it can wait for the result. And that is the thing that we are going to return, like so.、Um, so internally in the handle, we are then going to have, I guess, keep running, which is an arc atomic pool.、Um, and、uh, so、let's call it a. Uh, executor, which is a join handle,、uh, thread join handle over result of、uh, nothing. Is that true?、Yeah, so this is going to be that、uh, result of nothing and the error type. Right? So the handle has. A way to terminate and a way to wait for the result. Now, let's see. Wait. Actually, let's do terminate first because terminate is a lot easier than wait. Terminate is very, very straightforward. Self, keep running, store, false. That's all we need there. So this, is,、um, this sets keep running to false. Which means that this loop would eventually finish, which means that this thread would eventually return. And so, therefore, we have now successfully、um, finished. Now, there's one thing to note here, and we're going to end up documenting this.、Um, and that is that if this will only work if for each does not block forever. So, notice that if for each block forever, this,、uh, we would never get past this, this match. Which means that we wouldn't get back to check and keep running, which means that we would never terminate. This is sort of similar to what you end up in,、um, in Tokyo、uh, if you were to, or any kind of asynchronous IO, really. If you have a function that blocks, you're just like holding up the threads because they have no way of doing sort of cooperative scheduling, which is basically what we're implementing here.、Um, There are a couple of ways around this. So,、um, you could have your for each do asynchronous system calls. So, that way they return if there's nothing to do and you would just loop again.、Um, the other way to do this would be to have, and we can maybe play with this later if we have the time, is you can send a signal to, the, to, to your own process. And sometimes signals can interrupt running or blocking system calls.、Um, and that would be one way to sort of be a little bit trickier on that. I don't really want to implement that workaround though, because it's not particularly portable.、Um, but we can look at that later. But just be aware that, that this scheme will only work if we every now and again return from for each.、Uh, specifically, when you, and we'll document this on terminate, terminate is really、um, the next time you, were, you would have fetched more work,、um, return instead. It is not like a. Terminate what is currently running. It turns out that's actually very, very difficult to do. If you have many threads, you can't just like shoot down threads arbitrarily, in a, certainly not in an easy and portable way. All right, so wait、um, is a little bit trickier.、Um, and to see why, remember how handle is clone? 
So join handles are not cloned because if you wait on the thread in one th if you wait on the thread once and then try to wait on it again, the second time wouldn't give you anything useful. Mm. And so here we're going to have to do a little bit of trickery. So either we could have handle, um, either we could have handle not be cloned, but that breaks our example, right? Because now, um, uh, now we can't give away a handle to some thread that's eventually going to call end and call wait in main. Um, and so that's a little bit sad. Um, if we do implement clone, we're going to have to have something like an atomic option around this. Um, and it turns out that in fact, there is a, uh, atomic option. There is an atomic option crate. Ooh, that's not at all what I wanted. Uh, atomic option. I, I can't spell atomic option. What? Uh, Atomic option. Oh, fine. Um, yeah, so atomic option is, is uh, oh, you have to do bank crates. Okay. So atomic option is pretty nice. It gives you basically exactly what you what you thought you'd get. Um, you get a an option that you can that is sync. So it only and it only takes uh, ref selfs. So you can take it or swap it out atomically across multiple threads. And so we could totally wrap the join handle here in an atomic option. It would actually have to be an arc atomic option and the join handle would have to be on the heap, which is a little bit sad. Um, the other way around this is to say that if you have a handle, um, you can imagine that we let the user split that handle into a terminator and a waiter, right? So on the waiter, you can call wait or terminate. Um, ooh, ooh, here's, here's, I think what we do. Um, so, ah, yes, 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 yes. We have a new struct and it's gonna be a, uh, it's like a remote handle, but remote handle is a terrible name. So bear with me. Um, this is gonna have a keep running, but not an executor. And on handle, you're going to do, you're going to have a method that's going to be, uh, get remote. The, these names are currently terrible. This is just to, to show you the rough idea of this returns a remote handle. Um, and it's really just remote handle, uh, keep running. And then impl key, uh, remote handle. So on remote handle, you have a terminate method as well. So the reason to do this is now remote handle, which can also be cloned, but it's not terribly important. Now our main would be something like, uh, like exit is h dot get remote. And now we could move, um, now we can move exit into here, right? because the exit is sort of devoid from the handle. So there's only one handle that you can use to wait, uh, and that is the one that you originally used to spawn, um, but, there is, but you can get additional handles for if you want to be able to terminate separately. Mm. But what's a better name for this? So ideally, I don't really want to call things handle either, but I think this would be something like a canceller. It sounds terrible. What's a better name for canceller? Um, I can't even think about one. All right, fine. Canceller. Canceller it is. Um, so this would be canceller. <laughs> Executioner, yeah, that's true. Um, well, so so one of the reasons I don't, so I don't really want to use the word terminate or kill here because terminate and kill and <laughs> executioner have the, the sort of uh, associated meaning of something ends immediately, whereas that is not true here, right? Terminate here is really just a signal that we will eventually terminate, 
Um, and this is why I think cancel is a better name because a cancel just means uh, I no longer want you to do what I wanted you to do, right? Whereas execution is like stop right now or terminate. Um, so I guess this should actually be called cancel is really the, if that makes roughly makes sense. Um, so now on handle, you can get a canceler, you can cancel and you can wait. And now our wait is also pretty straightforward. Uh, self dot, and now this doesn't need to be an atomic option at all, which is nice. Um, self dot executor dot join. And here we're gonna have to do a little bit of magic. So if this is okay, then what we really got is uh, R here as a result. So remember, what we get back here from dot join, uh, where's our join documentation back here, join returns a, this is a thread result of T. So it's one of these guys. Um, so the thing we get back from join is a result and our T here, our T here is also a result, right? So we get a result of result. So the OK here, the R is one of these results, right? So this is just going to return R and that's all fine. The issue is if we get an E, what do we do, right? Here, I don't actually have a, a good answer for you, but I think what we want to do here is we want to panic with E. Um, essentially, we're propagating the panic, right? We're saying that if you call wait, you want to act as if you were the thread that ran the loop. And that's basically what this does, right? Um, it does lose some of the information about where the original panic happened, which is sad, but I don't have a good way of um, expressing that. Basically, what we're doing here is we're saying that if the thread we're waiting on panicked, then we will panic in the same way. Um, it could be that this should be like, uh, instead just give a message that, hey, the underlying thread panicked, but I think that really the right thing to do for wait, the sort of the semantics of mate should, wait should be that, um, it's sort of like a poisoned lock, right? Like if you try to take a lock um, that was previously held by a thread that, um, that aborted, the panicked, then the thread, the next thread that tries to take the lock will panic because the lock has been poisoned by the, the other thread that panicked. And we're sort of doing the same thing here. We're saying that if the, if the main, if the executor, the main loop panicked, then we will also panic. Um, okay, let's see. So let's, um, let's try to make this into an example that works. So I think this code does now, oh, I guess this will have to be canceller. Uh, let's run cargo format. That's much better. Um, it's complaining about spawn. where self is, oh, right. So um, traits do not generally require the type that you implement on to be um, sized. Um, but usually because you take receivers that are references, those are already sized. Specifically, they're the size of a reference. Uh, here, we're saying we're gonna take self by value. So we're gonna consume self but that will only work if self is a, is a size type. So imagine here, for example, that someone tried to implement cancelable for, uh, well, what's a good example of this? Implement cancelable for send. That's not a meaningful term, right? Like, because send is not a type that you can construct, it's not sized. Um, and certainly then consuming something consuming a send doesn't really make sense. So we want to say that you can only call spawn if uh, self is sized and send. Um, what else is it complaining about? It is complaining that handle does not have a new, that is true. We're just gonna construct it manually instead. Executor is join handle. Here, uh, self, that is true. What else? Uh, 
Right, so we're spinning up a thread here, so we actually require that the um, the current type and the error type um, basically live forever, so we need them to be static. Uh, the intuition here is imagine that um, you try to implement cancelable for something that's on the stack. Um, so you, you have some local variable in the... Okay, what's a better example of this? Imagine that you have a something like a food. You have this. And you call this dot spawn, right? Um, where foo here is a particular instance of the type foo. Um, then if you did this, and then this code in spawn is trying to do thread spawn of that. That's basically what we're trying to make it do, right? However, you can't move this reference. It's tick A, right? So it, it refers to something and you don't actually know how long the spawn uh, method will, the the spawned thread will run for, it might outlive A. Specifically, spawn requires that its arguments are static, and because both the uh, error and self are being moved through the thread, we need both of those to be static as well. Um, now what? Can I borrow immutable capture? Uh, that's true. So this is, this is actually a, an error that's been bothering me for a little while. It's telling me here that basically I'm not allowed to call a mutable ref mutable method on self. So remember that um, self for each takes a mute self. It's telling me here that self is not mutable and therefore I can't call a mutable method on it. It's a little annoying because really what it should do is just point out that here, this needs to be mute. That's really what it's trying to tell me, but there's nothing in the error that actually communicates that. And that's a little sad. All right, so we now have code that compiles. Great. So now let's see if we can get the example to work out. Uh, check examples. So obviously currently not gonna work. Um, this is going to use, yeah, that error isn't great. Um, it like the error is fine. It's just not particularly helpful. Um, like, I don't think it's confusing because it is true that self was captured and it is immutable and it cannot be borrowed as mutable. It's just unhelpful. <laughs> uh, and I think the compiler should be able to do better. Um, right, so here we're gonna use minion um, and we're gonna use studnet. Uh, those are probably the biggest things. We're gonna have a uh, struct listener, which basically just wraps a net TCP listener. And we're going to implement, all right, I guess it's called a service. And we're going to implement minion cancelable for service. So the idea here is some like very straightforward network server that just like accepts connections in a loop and does something with them. Um, so for this, the only method we're required to implement is for each. The other two have default implementations. So for each. Um, takes a mute self and returns a minion loop results and over e right so we need a an error type here that's going to be um, io error so this is going to return a self error lookup results. And for each is really just going to be what we used to have down here of, oh, that's a good point. I think we want to implement just to make this a little bit easier to use with, so here we want to be able to do something like listener.accept question mark, right? So we, we want to be able to have, um, uh, have people use the question mark operator inside of this, uh, basically have errors turn into a loop result break. Right, um, and the way we can do that is by where's the um, carrier, or is it now called try? I can never remember. Try. Yeah, so we basically want to implement uh, try. Where's that here? We want to implement. Um, try for lookup result e. 
this is basically what, what implementing try means is that um, users will be able to use the question mark operator on uh, things that can be turned into loop result or on loop result itself. Um, in this case, our OK type is blank. Our error type is uh, E. Um, into result is going to be uh, match self um, loop result. You can actually turn into other errors with question mark using from. So the reason I can't use from here is because um, I want to turn something into loop result. It's not that I want to turn loop result into this. So I don't think it's sufficient, but I might be wrong. Uh, I don't think it's sufficient to do um, impl from results e for loop result e. Uh, from generates an into implementation. That's true. Yeah, I mean, maybe this will work. We can try it. Um, so from our results, uh, R, and we want OK of this to give a, I guess, loop result continue, probably. See, this is why I think we need try because, um, well, it might be fine. All right, uh, or it returns a loop result uh, break. Uh, let's see, so yeah, we, we're gonna try to accept the stream um, and then we are going to in this case, our for each is very straightforward. It's just going to print a little, uh, I guess it will write to the stream. Uh, hello. And then it will close the stream and return. It's a uh, minion loop result continue. So notice that this will never actually return. It's just going to keep accepting connections forever. Um, and we want, of course, impl service uh, and new returns to self. I guess technically we should probably do default, but uh, this is going to do, it's going to just like set up a TCP listener of some sort. Uh, in this case, net TCP listener bind uh, zero, uh, one, two, zero, 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 one, 56. Great, best port. Uh, this is just gonna unwrap for now, because it's not terribly important. And then it will turn a service listener. Uh, we don't need this anymore. Our main is going to be, it's going to start a service. You think you saw a small issue in the from implementation? Uh, probably. Oh, yeah, this should say error. There's a question whether this should say break or continue. I think it should probably say break to be semantically similar, but no. If, you, if a, an operation does not fail, then it should continue. <clears throat> All right, so we want S is going to be a service new. Um, and then just to demonstrate that this works, we are going to call just uh, S dot run for now. And now let's see if I run example basic. No minion in the root. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, really? Oh, next to create minion. Want automatic external crates. Uh, I cannot find listener. This gives the system self of zero. Yeah, see? Won't work. 
I need to implement try for lookup result. The, the reason here is it doesn't know that if you have a result, you can, uh, yeah, exactly. Question mark is only defined over result. Um, and that's why you have to explicitly implement try. Um, so like this is maybe useful, but really what we need is this, which is a little sad because it requires nightly. Um, try trait is the thing. Uh, feature try trait. But hey, it's another interesting thing to learn. It's unstable to implement for anything else. Derp, yeah. Uh, right, so lookup result, the okay type is nothing. Ooh. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so lookup result error E is be going to become error E. Anything else is gonna become okay. Uh, from error is going to be a loop result error v and a from ok is going to be a loop result continue. I think that should do it. Huh? Uh, standard ops try. Uh, so what we're doing here is basically um, we're implementing try so that you can use question mark in this case and question mark will take the error if accept errors it will be returned as a loop result normally question mark just returns results right um one way we could get around this is uh, actually here i have a let's be smarter about this uh loop state it's going to be uh one of these and this is going to return a result loop state. And now you can import into, uh, yeah, exactly. So I, I don't want the user to have to explicitly call into because it's a little bit sad, but this is going to make everything work and we're not going to need try trait. Um, so the idea is that question mark is always defined for, um, for result, so let's just have an error in for each be an error in a result. Um, and then this problem just goes away. So we're gonna match on this. If it is okay, loop state, well, basically this or this is an okay. Um, and this is an error. That's much nicer. Um, yeah, yeah, much better. So this basically uh, gets us away from having to implement try ourselves. Uh, what is it complaining about? I think it's uh, complaining even though it shouldn't be. Uh, oh, loop state. I guess loop state is not a great name, but it's fine. Great. So now this will return instead a result of a minion loop state. And this will be an OK minion loop state continue. I don't really want this to be called loop state. Uh, okay, fine. All right. Let's try to run it. Um, no. Oh, uh, I don't care about the socket address. I just want, uh, when I get a stream, I just want the stream. Um, and I need to use, ooh, yeah, we can do the nested imports. Um, method run not found. Oh, right, use minion cancelable. Uh, stream has to be mute, and service has to be mute. Uh, 25, we're gonna unlock that. Great, so now in theory, we should be able to do, uh, do I really not have netcap on this machine? 
That's not great. Uh, ooh, tough. I want, I think I want the GNU one. Uh, which one do I have over here? Maybe it's the OpenBSD one I have. Yeah, OpenBSD one. It compiles! Ship it! We're done! No. All right, OpenBSD netcat, uh, and then we're gonna netcat to localhost 6556. We get a hello! Great! What if we do it again? We get a hello! Great, so, okay, our service works. Uh, that's all fantastic. But now, of course, the problem is how do you quit it? So currently, we can just press Control c and Control c will just, like, kill the process and that's fine. But you could totally imagine that like the service also has like a database connection and stuff that we want to terminate. And that's why we have this whole thing in the first place. So what we're going to do is we are, instead of just running inline, we are going to do s dot, what do we call it? Spawn. Uh, we're going to get a canceller, move that into a thread. This thread is gonna, This thread is going to sleep. This is pretty arbitrary, but from sex black temp. So the idea here is that um, the server is only going to be running for 10 seconds. And then after that, it's gonna go away. So we're gonna say something like, uh, server running, uh, server terminating, server terminated. Um, fantastic. Okay, so if we now run this, we will, ooh. Yeah, right. Also part of the format. Uh, so if we now run this example, oh, remove mute. Why does it not need to be? Oh, because S consumes self. That's right. Right. So the server is now running, and if we wait for a little while, it should then say that the server is terminating, and we're gonna now observe that the server doesn't actually terminate. Yeah. So you see here, the server has now been told that it should terminate. So this is why we we really called cancel. Uh, but the server hasn't terminated yet. So in fact, if we if we do the if we try to connect to it, we will get hello, and then it terminated. And this is because it only terminates once we go back around this loop again. Um, and so this is sort of a known shortcoming and something we'll have to document. Um, but it doesn't mean that it works, right? So here we can do this multiple times, and that's all good. And then at some point it's going to say server terminated, and then we can no longer do it. So that's fine. And now we get connection terminated because the server is no longer running. So we have a cancelable service. That is fantastic. It's almost as though that's what we tried to build. Good job, team. Um, now, let's see. Um, I also want this just for completeness. I want to start shut down. Am I allowed to do that? Our stream got shut down. Oh, have they? That's right. Uh, sh shut down. I need this thing. Shut down with net. Shut down both. With a result. Now, oh, why doesn't it? Oh, I guess this is netcat that keeps trying to be helpful. I don't really need that. I close the service anyway. Okay, so now we have a crate that works. It does the thing that we designed it to. So now we can start to do the nicer thing. Let's first do a git add dot. Uh, server, uh, it all works. Um, 
Ah, I don't have any other windows. Oh no. It's too bad. Well, um, okay, so we have a commit. We will go to GitHub. We will make a new repository. I have way too many repositories at this point. Uh, minion, uh, Rust, uh, crate for managing cancelable services. Uh, I don't want to read me. I do eventually want a license, but that's fine. Now let's do this. This again. <clears throat> all right, it's now been pushed, so you can all uh, look at the code if you want. Um, oh, did I forget to uh, cargo format all before I did that? No, great. I don't know why my Rust format is not working anymore. Now we're gonna do all of the things that people are supposed to do before they publish a crate. So we're gonna turn on deny missing docs, and we are also going to do a vimdiff of cargo.toml, actually, we can just do this. So whenever you publish a crate, um, there are a couple of fields that you should set. So if you start out with just the cargo.toml that uh, cargo gives you when you do new, it's very, very basic, right? It has the name, it has your name, and it has the version, which is just 0 0.1. If you look at the cargo manifest, or just like look at any existing crate. So usually what I do is I um, take some old crate of mine that I know is decently well um, documented like, you know, like factory RS, for example. Um, so here, if you look at the cargo.toml, it has a bunch of stuff in it. And I sort of try to basically replicate what's in here. Um, so in this case, I want description. And description can just be what we used here. I want a better description of this in cancelable services, but I don't have a good sense for that. Uh, documentation is actually now, ooh, read me, yeah. Um, documentation is now defaults to docs.rs, so you don't have to specify it anymore, which is kind of nice. Uh, homepage and repository, you do have to specify, I think. I don't think it defaults to, um, uh, I don't think it defaults to the GitHub stuff that crates.io sees that you're linked with yet. Um, keywords are basically unimportant. They're mostly there for a search. Um, categories are a little bit more important. I think here, this will be something like service cancel. Uh, service cancel, sure, why not? Um, categories are a little bit more interesting just because they're harder to find. So you go here, that lists all the categories. Um, and looking through very roughly, I think there are pretty few of these that apply to us. Um, let's see. Maybe network programming? Unclear. It should function without the, no, it needs threads. Uh, Rust patterns, maybe. All right. Um, the really annoying part here is that um, crates.io does not tell you which keyword to put in your cargo.toml for this category. Like, I think it's network dash programming. In fact, yeah, it looks like I've used that before. Uh, but there are some of the other ones, like, you know, um, if you look at something like internationalization. I don't know what tag to use here. Is the i18n there? So basically what you have to do is you like go to the repository, you click their cargo.toml, and then you look at what category they listed. And lo and behold, the i18n does not actually show up here. Um, it's a little bit sad. All right, so we want network programming, programming and probably Rust patterns, which, yeah, so here's an example. I think we have to go here, cargo.toml, and this is Rust dash patterns. So usually you can guess what it is, but you never quite know. All right, what else do we have? Uh, license, sure, we will put this because that's what Rust defaults to, which also means that we need to copy in, I wish Cargo could do this for you, but I guess I kind of understand why they don't. Those to here. Um, 
we're going to add Travis for this because it's just good to do. That's going to be a uh, minion. So this, uh, the badges entry here is if you go to crates.io and you go to some crate bus, um, or it's maybe a bad example. Uh, ooh. Well, it basically shows a badge here on the side as well. Although the badge here is a little sad. Why is it failing? Uh, fine. We can deal with that separately. Um, and I think that's all we really have to list. Um, we now need a readme. So for readmes, um, I've basically fallen in love with cargo readme. So cargo readme. This thing. Um, I wish there was a better way that was integrated into the language, but the basic idea is that it uses the crate level documentation of your crate. So the um, the stuff that we are going to put like this at the top, it takes all of the documentation that's here and generates it and put it puts it in your readme.md. Um, so the basic idea is you have a readme.tpl file and readme.tpl contains any other text that you want to be in the readme. And then somewhere you put, I think it's crate or something. Um, in fact, I can just uh, copy this as well from somewhere. Readme tpl, a better one, like uh, factory. Um, readme tpl, and if you look at readme tpl, it's basically just a, you just put other stuff that you don't want to be in your, um, in your crate level docs. And you put that here, in this case, crate is gonna be the name of the crate, so that's gonna say minion. Um, we want a link to crates.io. Place all of factory RS with factory, and replace factory with minion. And I don't have Windows build, and I don't have code cov. Great. So here I'm basically adding three badges. These are pretty standard. One is to crates.io, one is to docs.rs, and one is for the Travis build status. Uh, and then readme is the stuff that it generates from your um, from your crate level docs. Um, so now if we do a cargo check, it's going to complain at me because nothing is documented. Um, the documentation here is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, I'll do the crate level docs last because it's usually useful to go through all the other things first. So loop state is um, indicate whether main server loop service loop should continue accepting new work. Um, accept more work. Uh, stop accept more work and return. Um, so one thing that I think uh, a lot of crates make this decision of trying to figure out where you put examples. Do you put them in, do you put examples for every method? Do you put it for the uh, wrapping struct or do you put them in the crate level docs? I like to put them on structs and on top level docs mostly, unless there's one method that is particularly complicated. Um, so if there's one where I expect that people who use this method will not quite understand how to use it, uh, including a specific use case example for that is good. But in general, like if you just think about when you browse docs yourselves, uh, you, uh, it's much more useful to like the moment you get to the crate documentation, immediately see the examples and just be able to copy and paste this code. Similar to if you're working with a particular struct, um, you sort of want to know stuff about that struct straight away. You don't want to have to go in and like expand the individual methods to figure out what they do. And if you're looking at a method, you probably care what it does, but you don't necessarily wonder about why you would call it because you're already looking at the method. Uh, and so that's the pattern I'm gonna follow here too. So we'll probably end up with an example here. We'll probably end up with an example here, um, but we will not end up with examples for the individual methods. Um, we'll also probably want to test for this. It's a little hard to test, maybe. Actually, no, it'll be fine. I just have to run some TCP servers and clients, and that's fine. All right, so cancelable. Uh, uh, 
services that implement Ooh, so this is another thing that recently i don't think it's in stable yet um but it is really useful and that is automatic dock uh, Dock links. Dock links. Well, okay. So what you can do is uh, this. So note that there's no link after this. You just put cancelable in ticks and with uh, with links. And now I guess I can turn off this for a second. Um, now if I cargo doc, if I generate docs for this now, um, and I go into cancelable, note that cancelable is now a link to cancelable automatically, and it will go to the right place as well. Um, this is not used to be the case. You would have to do something here like. Uh, trait dot cancelable dot html maybe like method is uh method dot for each and stuff which is really annoying um whereas now the links are generated automatically for you i think this is nightly only for now um but it's gonna land in stable pretty soon and it's quite exciting um a service that implements cancelable we don't actually need a link to cancelable here because it's already what we're talking about, but it can be useful in general. Um, uh, emulates. Uh, uh, service that implements cancelable uh, can be told to stop accepting new work at any time and will return at the first opportunity. First of all, um, yeah, the doc thing is really, really nice. And it, it makes writing integrated docs just so much nicer. That so often you want to do things like, even just here, like I want to be able to say, uh, like imp for this, you, you need to implement. And then I want to say like cancelable for each. And if I had to dig up what the URL for this was every time, it would be really annoying. But now if I go here, this will just work. It'll just be a link to the correct thing immediately, which is very, very nice. Um, more concretely, so one thing I've found useful, especially for API wrapper types like this, is to give some pseudocode for sort of what your library is doing without all of the detail, because I think it helps understanding a lot. Um, it emulates a loop like the following. Uh, loop fetch some work, do some work. Uh, But where the so 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 here like the, remember this is what we started out in the very beginning in the example we started out with code like this as this is sort of what we're trying to do and giving that in your docs can just be really helpful. Um, but where the loop can be uh, uh, cancelled, that is uh, after the next piece of work is processed, uh, no more work is handled, and the loop breaks. Um, this trait provides two main methods. Uh, and here again, we can use that same thing. I don't know if this will work if I just say spawn. That's a good question. I really wanted to. It does not. That's too bad. Uh, I wish it would realize that I'm documenting this type and that when I say spawn, I mean that method on this type. But alas, maybe later. Um, 
and can uh, cancelable is a terrible word. I guess this is run and spawn. The former runs the loop on the current thread and and thus blocks it. I think in general libraries need to be pretty good about telling consumers of the API when they block and when they don't. This is becoming increasingly important when people start adopting futures and async IO um, because it can just be devastating if you block and you weren't expecting it. Um, the latter spawns a new thread and executes the uh, main loop, executes the loop on that thread. Um, only uh, loops started using spawn can be canceled. And then here we sort of want to give an example and we can probably then sort of reuse this one. Um, so here the user doesn't, or the reader doesn't really have the same context as we do. Uh, so they don't have all this like TCP stuff, but here we don't really want to tell them about what the service is doing because it's not all that important. Um, what we really want to show them is uh, just like the general idea of how, as a user of this library, how you would use it. Um, so we can do something like this. And here we can use the really handy trick by starting a line with bang, uh, you can hide lines. So in our case, we will basically hide, um, oh, ah. Uh, We'll basically hide something like use minion star so that we don't have to prefix all of this with minion. Um, so here, the idea is here the service is, well, the server isn't really running. Here the server is running. Um, it might be that we want a callback on spawn so that if the user wants to run something on the thread that has the main loop, they have that option, but we'll leave that alone for now. We could have a builder for services, for example. Um, I guess here we're going to need something like the user doesn't know what a service is, which is a little annoying. Uh, if we want something like impl for service. And then we want, uh, let's see. Um, so spawn start the service service loop on another thread or a new thread. Um, get a handle that allows stop canceling the service loop. Spin up a new thread that will handle exit signals. And then in here we can do something like, uh, this might catch uh, C from the user. It's useful in the docs to sort of give the user an intuition for what's going on without necessarily giving them all the details. So here it doesn't really matter what happens in here, but we need to be clear to them that this is just example code. This particular line does not matter, whereas this line really does matter. Um, user uh, wait for a particular packet or for any other condition that signals that the service should exit cleanly. Uh, in this case, we just terminate after a fixed amount of time. Great, so this is gonna, remember that there's gonna be a test so we don't really want the test to run forever. Um, uh, tell the service loop to exit at the first uh, opportunity. Uh, 
uh, block. So we want to point out here that wait also blocks. So uh, block until the service loop exits or errors. Um, so now if you look at the docs, we get something quite nice and cancelable where this sort of is basically our example, but it doesn't have any of the other service stuff that we otherwise would have had. Um, so you don't need to know about TCP listeners or anything, but it shows you exactly the flow of what cancelable does. Um, there's an argument for maybe this should be in the crate level docs and cancelable should have an implementation example. Oh, might be a good point. Um, let me think about that for a second. Uh, I also want the line wrapping in cargo docs is a little annoying. There we go. Um, yeah, actually, let's move this into the crate level docs. Um, like so. And then for cancelable, we'll have an example that is basically the implementation that we had earlier. So we'll do something like here, like so. Um, use minimum star. I don't really want the user to have to see this either. Or this. So there's a question of whether we show this or not. I don't think it really matters, okay, but sure, why not? And I guess if we're being nice anyway, we should do this. It's nice, for examples, to not have unwrap. And part of the reason for this is because it is so common that people just take the code that's in examples and just runs them. Uh, they just like copy paste the code. Um, so it's nice for them to actually be be right. Um, and I guess we might have to give the main code again here, which is a little sad. Um, uh, why do programmers use error as a verb when error exists? I think it's because it's a little bit awkward to say err. Uh, this might just be because I'm foreign, but it sounds weird to say that something erred. Um, that's the best answer I can give you, I think. Um, so I guess here, what we could do is just because we only really care about running this. Actually, here's what we'll do. Um, this example doesn't really care about how you want to run your service or that you want to cancel it. All we care about is the fact, or sort of how you implement it. Um, we may have to give a little bit more explanation around this, but see now, so the crate level docs will have this example, which show basically how the crate is being used and cancelable has an example of how you would implement it. Um, we might have to provide some docs around this though. So here, um, for example, uh, the implementation below uh, shows how uh, classic server accept loop could be turned into a cancelable accept loop. Um, once cancel, I guess here we'll have to show something like, because it has to be handle is called, I guess uh, if is called, then uh, at most one more connection will be accepted. Before the loop exits, um, before the loop returns and uh, handle wait would uh, to 
I think one thing that is also nice in docs like these is to make sure that you tie together the whole workflow of the crate. So for example, if the cancelable documentation did not mention handle, people will have to realize that they get a handle back from spawn and then go look at the docs for handle. Whereas here, we sort of uh, point out which method, the, the fact that handle is relevant to cancelable and which, which methods are relevant on handle. Um, and that I think just makes it a lot nicer to work with. Um, I guess error here is a pretty trivial type. Um, uh, how are error type for each um, called once for every iteration of the loop? Um, this method is called. Yeah, I think the, I, I totally agree with you. The, the documentation integration that Rust has is fantastic. I do think that we don't have a good sense as a community of how it should be used yet. Um, like I think it would be nice to have some guidelines for even just things like what kind of language should you use? So here I've now said this method is called once. Um, it could also just say called once. It could say this method will be called once. Uh, like I think if we made them all more uniform, that would help a little. It would also be really nice if you could easily link to docs in other crates. Um, you can sort of do this in that you can refer to types that you like pub use, for example. Um, but sometimes I want to refer to like crate level docs of some other crate that I am depending on. And there isn't really a good way to do that. Um, it's also really neat that we now have um, doc include. So this landed pretty recently. At least I think it's landed now. Uh, doc include. Oh man, why can I not find any of these? Um, because it might not be open anymore. Um, so the basic idea, it seems like I can't quite find it now, but um, oh, it's really annoying. Um, but basically you can now do uh, this, which is really cool. So you can include, you can take a file that exists in the file system and make that file be the document, the contents of that file be the documentation for that method or that struct or that crate. Um, and of course you can use this for things like, uh, and I think this is one of the intended use cases is this, which is really neat. Now, I don't actually want to do this currently because it would also include things like badges and headers that I don't want to include there. And I don't have a good sense for how that would work. In part, this would be fixed if in readme, in the readme, you could also include a file. Then I could have some third file like readme inner or something that both of them included. But currently I don't actually want to use this. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, doc include is really nice. Um, and I, I think you're right that I think the docs are going to improve over time, but I do think we need to make sure that broadly used crates are well documented. And that, that is definitely happening with sort of a lot of the, the crate pushes that have been happening recently. People have been more aware of this. Um, this is part of why I spend so much time on this in uh, my live streams as well, because I think it's really important. And there's nothing more frustrating than coming to a crate and having it feel like it's not well documented and feel like you have to guess at what happens everywhere. Um, let's see, it's called once for each iteration of the loop. If it uh, returns, um, if it errors the outer uh, service loop will also return with that same error. If it uh, returns a loop state, the 
correspond the loop will continue or break accordingly. Uh, accordingly, uh, if it panics, um, the waiting thread uh, will the panic will be propagated to the waiting thread. So this is one of those cases where here we could give an example, but I don't think, uh, this reminds me that I should work on my crates sometime. Yeah, I think you should. I think working on crates is a good idea, uh, clearly. Um, so run here is pretty uninteresting. Uh, I mean, it's one of the core methods of our trait, but um, so the idea for run is uh, uh, continuously execute um, cancelable for each. This reminds me that I should make crates. Yeah, also true. I think the Rust ecosystem is becoming better. Like there are crates for a lot of useful things now. Um, but I think crates like this, like smaller crates are still really useful. And I think they're a, they're a good exercise in just like building good crates, like teaching yourself to build a good crate. Start with something small. Like you don't really want to start with something like, uh, uh, what's an example of this? So I started building, or I built bindings for the factory work service um, that was re recently published. And like, this is a fairly involved crate with lots of docs and you don't really want to start somewhere like this. You want to start with something smaller like what we're doing right now. Um, or like building a data structure is actually a really good start because data structures are almost always useful and like they're pretty straightforward to implement. Um, and you end up with something like board search. So this is one I built. It turns out that you should not use it. It's slower than anything else. But it was like, I found a paper with an interesting data structure and I implemented it. And it's not very long or complicated, but it is like fairly well documented. It has a bunch of tests, a bunch of benchmarks. It's just like a good way to get into writing good crates. Um, let's see, continuously execute cancelable for each until it errors. I guess this is where, uh, Rastafaro would like me to say until it airs. But see, that just feels weird. Mm. Returns an error. See, work around it. Uh, until it returns an error or uh, loop state break. Uh, continuously execute for each in a new thread. Uh, and return a handle. Uh, day structure seems to be something that is regarded as hard in Rust. Most of the time you need unsafe. So it's totally true for the data structures that I've implemented, especially things that come from research, like things that are related to concurrency, you do often have to use unsafe, but but that's okay. Like it's basically you're writing, to some extent you're writing C code, um, but only for core parts. So one of the things I found really interesting is to take, try to make the things that are unsafe as small as possible. So um, what's an example of this uh, in bus? Uh, so this is a, a broadcast channel implementation, um, it actually has fairly little unsafe code, uh, in part because most of the unsafe um, I've encapsulated in this thing called a slot. So this is like, um, it's like one, this, this mute seat state is the primary thing that's unsafe. And so I sort of encapsulate the unsafe in that and the rest of the code is mostly safe. Uh, and I think it's a, a good exercise to, to like this is why data structures are a good idea because it forces you to use a little bit unsafe but find a good way to encapsulate it so that your whole code base isn't unsafe. And you shouldn't, uh, as was pointed out in the chat as well, you shouldn't be unsafe. You shouldn't be scared of using unsafe, especially if you're willing to go into low level programming because unsafe is really just saying, I need to be careful about managing memory. Um, so I think, I, I don't think my claim would be that implementing data structures is 
straightforward necessarily, but I think it's a good exercise and it's not, um, it's not an overly large job, right? Um, like, I think it's a good starting point, especially if you want to learn how to write real Rust. You get to combine sort of unsafe with API design, with just like looking at cool data structures, which is nice. Um, and you get a better feel for the language and how it how it operates when you work at the at those kind of low levels. Um, yeah, that's not what I meant to do. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, um, documentation for unsafe would definitely be nice. There's the Nomicon, if you haven't seen it. So the Nomicon is uh, pretty useful for many of these things um, because it tells you a lot about sort of the low level details you need to make sure that you follow. Um, my crate is mostly unsafe because it does system API calls. Um, have you tried looking at Nix? So the Nix crate is really, really nice. Uh, so the Nix crate basically takes a bunch of, it takes lots of system calls that are um, fairly low level and wraps them in safe wrappers. So it often lets you get away with using, um, having no unsafe code while still using all these like more sort of uh, integrated syst uh, system calls. So you might want to look at that. Um, anyway, yeah, so, so Nomicon is worth looking at if you're looking at unsafe. Continuously execute, cancelable for each. Oh, the other thing I could recommend is look at other crates that people have built that use unsafe. Like, just like read the code. Um, I think Nix also does Windows, but I could be wrong. Uh, it's basically wrapping libc. Um, yeah, so you could read other crates. So for example, um, there's a... Uh, EV map is a data structure I wrote, which is actually really cool. And I, I think it's decently well documented. Um, and the source code, if you read through it, like there's definitely some unsafe in this. This is a pretty involved data structure, um, but it's like well commented and tries to explain why it is safe and correct. Um, and it sort of scopes all the unsafeness as little as possible. So you might find it interesting just like read something like this if you're if you're interested in learning how to write unsafe code and how to write more involved data structures in Rust. Uh, back to our crate. Continuously execute callable cancelable for each in a new thread and return a handle uh, to that loop so that it can be cancelled or waited for. Uh, great. A handle um, is a reference to a handle or handle to a running um, service loop. You can use this handle. You can use it to cancel the running loop at the next opportunity to uh, through handle cancel. See how useful this feature is? See how many times I've used this? I'm s so surprised they didn't have this sooner, but I'm very happy they have it now. Um, uh, or to wait for the loop to terminate through and I'll wait. Um, if you want, uh, see, this is another thing that I don't know what to do about docs. I think in some cases it makes a lot more sense to talk about you as in talking to the developer directly. And in some cases it's sort of more passive about what the function does. For for each, I think it's more reasonable to talk about the operation of the function. Whereas for handle, I think it's useful to tell the user, like you would use this handle because you're gonna be given one. You're not gonna implement one, but you're gonna be given one. And that changes the tone. Um, you can also use uh, canceler to get a um, handle canceler to get a cancel. <laughs> This is going to have a lot of cancel in it, the sentence. You can also use canceler 
to get a um, canceller handle, which lets you terminate the service loop from another thread or from elsewhere or while waiting. Uh, canceller is just a handle that allows the cancellation of a running service loop. I'm a little bit sad that we now have two cancel implementations. Mm, I think I want this to be canceller. Uh, Yeah, so I'm gonna have handle deref into canceller instead, because that way we will only have one, and that way we only have to document the method once. Um, so canceller is gonna be canceller keep running. Um, and then now we're gonna use ops deref, impl deref for handle. Target is canceller. Deref is so useful. It should be used everywhere. Um, Deref self into. I've used it so much that I now know the full type signature of the trait. Um, canceller. So now this method can go away from here because you can call it call it through handler. Uh, Let's see, cancel the, uh, get a, another handle for canceling the service loop. This can be handy if you want the current thread, if you want one thread to wait for the service loop to exit while another watches for uh, exit signals. So here, wait is pretty straightforward. Wait for the service loop to exit and return its result. Here, we have to be careful. So if you look at the standard library, you'll see that there are a bunch of cases where they have um, subtitles for sections like panics. Um, I don't, panics. Um, I don't know whether I like that. Uh, part of the reason is because you end up with a section that's fairly large that has very little content in it. So usually I just put it straight in text. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense though, if you have a very long documentation here, then you want panics to be clear to show that it can't panic. Um, if the service loop panics, this uh, method will also panic. Uh, with the same error. Great, and finally, cancel. Uh, cancel the currently running service loop. Note that this will not interrupt uh, a currently executing uh, Cancelable for each. Um, instead, um, cancelable for instead the next time cancelable for each would be called uh, the service loop will return. Great, we're almost done. Let's see, so now crate level docs. Uh, this crate provides a um, uh, wrapper type for making long running service loops cancelable. Uh, in particular, 
We could just give the docks here. Ooh, that's not really what I wanted. Uh, expected function cancel. Expected function found struct. Did I do something silly? Uh, oh, canceler has fields. That's why. Also, cargo format. Cargo T. Five. Fine. Uh, oh, did not like that. Line six. Oh, right. We need to do some trickery. We're going to do uh, struct service uh, in full cancelable for service. Uh, we just need a dummy implementation so that the Code will actually compile uh, for each takes a new self and does nothing. And I, uh, we need the return type. Return type is going to be unit. It's going to return result unit unit. How about now? Um, use of Oh, I'm using thread and time here too. Time, thread. This is uh, one of the more mundane parts of writing uh, doc tests. Is It's just really annoying to debug them because um, you need to recompile them every time and they're actually fairly slow to compile. Um, the question mark operator can only be Oh, they don't have, can't use question mark in doc tests yet. You can use question marks in main now, but not in doc tests. Uh, fine. We will do, we will cheat and do fn foo. Well, I mean, you can fake this by doing what I'm about to do, but it's uh, it's not great. So this is going to be, um, I guess, an IO result of nothing. See how pesky this is? For each as an incompatible type for trait. That is true. It has to return loop state. Loop state. Uh, okay, loop state. Break. Yeah. So the in doc test the um, the leading hash is really really useful. It's just like, oh, impulse service fn new returns a self, self. Am I allowed to do that? Um, and you'll see in a second why they're really useful. Basically, this code looks pretty horrible right now, but the resulting output in cargo doc will look very straightforward. The downside of doing this is, and I've had this happen in the past, is that people will copy paste the code that they see and expect it to run, whereas all this hidden stuff is also required for the code to run. Um, and so that does trip at least some users up. Um, expected result found nothing. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I guess actually 
This is definitely a hack. Um, expected. All right. Dot unwrap. Yeah, so basically what I'm doing here is the user is going to think that this happens in main, uh, but in fact, it's happening in this other function that gets called from main. Um, and until we get question mark in doc test, which like is something that we'll likely get in not too long, um, you have to pull this kind of stuff. Oh no, it's gonna, oh, it's, that's not great. I want no run on this. Because otherwise, the, this service is cancelable, but there are no requests. So if we actually run this test, um, then it's just going to block waiting on this PCP listener. Uh, we will actually write a test that that does this, but we will not do that in the doc test, probably. 11. Uh, self is not a value. Service. Why can't I use self there? That's weird. All right, great. So now all the doc tests pass. So if you now look at the output after all of that, this still looks the same, um, but it is now actually verified at compile time that this code would indeed compile, which is nice. Uh, if we go to cancelable, same with this code, this code, notice how the user can't tell that there's anything weird going on here. Uh, and this means that this will basically just work wherever they put it. We could have a function, we could actually call this main. Uh, it would actually be a little, it's actually, I don't think we can. So we can't actually make that look as though it's in main, I think. Oh yeah, no, we totally can do this. Uh, so now it will look like this is just in main, but in reality, it's actually in foo. And it still works just fine. Um, cancelable, right? So it now looks like it looks like the way it would work if now that main can return uh, can use the question mark operator. I have to write a middleware that will consume some JSON XML, and I'm thinking to implement it in Rust. So it will be my first experience with the language. Any cargo package that I can use or useful advice? Um, yeah, sorty JSON is a good place to start. Um, it sort of depends on what you're gonna do with that and also what you'd mean by middleware. Like if you're thinking HTTP middleware, you probably want to use Hyper as well. Um, but I'm sure people can help you in the chat as they are already as well. Um, okay, so we look at these docs. They actually look pretty nice. You know, a pretty decent start. I think the, um, the biggest thing that's missing now is we want a, uh, Let's dive right in with an example. Further details, uh, for further details, see cancelable. Okay, so this is gonna be a little bit annoying because uh, this link is not actually gonna work when we generate our readme. So cargo readme will, will just turn this into a regular link, but that is gonna be a relative link, which won't work. So we will actually have to be a little bit finicky here and say um, docs rs, it's going to be slash minion eventually, star minion struck uh, trait cancelable HTML. It's going to be a link. It's uh, a little sad. All right. So now if you see, if we do a cargo readme to readme MD, we now have a readme MD file that has everything we had in uh, source lib. Oh, did I mess that up? I did. It should be this. Great. All right, so we're getting pretty close. Uh, I think the, let's do this, um, commit uh, document all the things and hide this window. 
And then we will also do, oh, I messed that up, didn't I? Cancel. Uh, I also want to add the dot. Now we can push it. That. Um, so the other thing that we will want to do Yeah, so if you have questions about Rust, the, the Rust Discord is pretty good. Uh, there's also the Rust IRC channel where people are really, really helpful. Um, so it sort of depends which thing you uh, prefer. Um, the Rust uh, users.rustlang.ro, uh, users.rust-lang.org uh, also has um, a really good place for you to, uh, you to ask questions and everyone is basically super helpful. Um, Right, so the last thing I think we want here, first of all, we're going to publish this because otherwise uh, one of you sneaky people might uh, steal the name. So we're going to run Cargo Publish. And if we're really lucky, this will work. Hey, crates, crates, minion. Success. Now we just need to set up Travis and write a test. All right, so we're gonna do config tests, mod tests, test. Um, it uh, runs, sure. So here, we're basically gonna take our example, uh, just change my crate to use Nix. Oh yeah, Nix is great. Nix is really great for these things. Um, Examples, we're going to do this. Specifically, I want uh, M7. Is there a good way to bind to any port? Mm, I think that I can do like fn port self. To use 16. Specifically, I want every test to use its own port. Um, use super. Uh, implement cancelable for service. It's going to do all those things. It's going to write back low. That's all fine. Um, service and that. This is going to be, what is the Rust documentation for TCP listener? Can I get the port out of that easily? Local adder, local adder dot unwrap, because this is a test anyway, gives me a socket adder, which has a dot port. Unwrap dot port. Great. So now, our tests should be able to do something like, uh, it's gonna start a service. Uh, in fact, it's going to, uh, service is gonna be a thread. So the idea, the idea here for this test is we're gonna spin up the server and then we're also gonna start a TCP client we're going to have the TCP client keep connecting to the service and then check various canceling behaviors, um, which should be pretty straightforward. Um, this is just going to dot run like so. Um, new uh, dot run dot unwrap. Um, oh. Be a little bit annoying. No, this is fine. Uh, S is going to be the service, and then here we're going to do s dot run dot unwrap. We're going to get the port, which is going to be s dot port. Um, so on one thread we're going to run the main service loop, and then on this thread we're going to try to connect to it. So we're going to do TCP stream. Uh, connect. Uh, the client is going to connect to 127001. Uh, 
this is gonna bind to any port. Don't need main. Um, this is gonna connect to this and that port. And then we can sort of assert, we, can, we could here potentially assert that we read hello. But let's just for now check if this works. Um, let's see if I run cargo test now. Ooh. Why? Oh, is it config test? Yeah. Um, this is not going to be minion anymore. This is not going to be minion. Time is going to be used eventually. Um, five, three, that needs this to be Great, yeah, so this works fine. So basically it successfully connected to here. Um, for reading, the easiest thing is probably here if we look at um, net, TCP stream. So TCP stream implements both read and write. In our case, we want uh, read. I want something that just reads all of it, but there is no such thing yet. So instead we have to do um, let r is string new c dot read, what is it, read to string read r dot unwrap and then we assert equal uh, r to hello. Oh, right. Right, so we now have a test that passes and this test spins up the service. So this is really just testing that run works. We, we have no reason to expect that it doesn't. Um, we do want to make sure that they, it doesn't like quit accidentally or something. So we run it twice, um, specifically because the server shouldn't exit between any given time that we connect. And indeed, if we run it, it passes uh, and everything is fine. The this run will of course never terminate, um, at least shouldn't be terminating, um, unless an error happens inside. So in fact, we're gonna have this return run, I think. Um, so I don't know if there's a good way to cause an error on the server side. So I think we're just gonna leave this test like that. Um, the other test of course we want is the, the whole reason we wrote all of this is because we want it to be able to be cancelable. So we will also have it cancels. Uh, and for it cancels, instead of run, what we will do is here, um, we will do s.spawn. So the handle is s.spawn. Um, and then we will connect and see that it works. And then we will connect again to see that it works. And then we will um, cancel the server service thread. And now we know that once more should work. I guess actually we can, uh, let's make our lives a little bit easier and do something like, uh, connect assert, which takes a port and does this. So we're going to connect assert port twice. Here, yeah, so the idea is that um, once we cancel, we know that we should be able to connect one more time. So remember, um, cancel will only mean that for each will not be called again. In this case, however, for each has already been called again because we, we process this connection. Um, and so now it's currently in trying to accept a new connection. So this should succeed, but then the next one should fail. So now we should do um, now I guess we should do h dot wait dot unwrap because we're not expecting there to have been an error but here we should expect that it immediately now returns 
I guess this does not need to be looped. And lo and behold, it does the right thing. Great. 259. I guess this isn't necessary. All right, so now we have one test that tests that we can run the service um, and it, it connects correctly. And indeed, when you call run, it will run forever. Um, and we have one where the checks that canceling actually works. Um, uh, we'll ensure that uh, for each is not called again. Uh, not that it, it will not... I think this is another thing that's important in Rust code is, um, or in, in not just in Rust code, but in general, is to document your tests, like document why your tests test what they do. Um, like here, for example, it's not clear why we try to connect and then wait if you don't intimately know the code. So in this case, uh, we want to say it will not terminate the currently running page. Now the loop uh, instead of calling for each again, the loop should now have exited. Uh, one thing that's missing here are tests for errors. So um, if a connection errors in some way, then that should perhaps be returned. Um, and we don't have a good way of dealing with that. We could test the panic, um, but I feel like that's probably not worthwhile at the moment. Um, all right, so let's now make sure that we also get support for Travis because we want integration testing for this. Uh, so here, I usually start out with something that I've used before. Um, so in our case, let's look at this Travis. This has a bunch of stuff that we don't need. Um, I don't need script and I don't need that. Uh, don't need sudo, don't need dist. Uh, this will work. Yeah, it will work on stable beta and nightly. We want to allow failures on nightly. Um, do I have any other reasons to suspect Travis? Um, no, I think that's all we want. Great. So now we add Travis. We also add all these tests. Let's go format them. Uh, add tests. And push. And now let's see. Minion. Let's see if we can give you that nice, nice check mark. Um, Minion, uh, Travis. That's a lot of tabs open. Let's get rid of some of those. Uh, add a repository. I want a uh, minion. Uh, fine. Uh, sync again. The other thing we might want to add is like code coverage, but I think it's a little bit less important for this particular project. Uh, it's also a little bit of a pain to set up still. So there's um, uh, a cargo tarpaulin, I think that's how you pronounce that, uh, which is basically a, a re-implementation of, of KCOV or sort of the code coverage monitoring tool or measuring tool um, written in Rust that works pretty well, um, but it, Travis, for various annoying reasons um, that aren't entirely their fault, um, they require you to have sudo, which means you can't run on the container infrastructure, and so your tests are all really slow, and it's pretty sad. All right, uh, we pushed. Now can I make it trigger build on master? Will that work? I don't know if that will work. Oh, uh, yeah. How about that? Let's see. In theory, this should be very straightforward because um, this is not a very complicated crate, but we will see. Follow. Yes. Stop. 
sanity check. I think we're all good. Ooh, do we have a minion yet on oh, Dr. S? We do! Hey, how about that? And now the big question, of course, is the readme. If I click this cancelable link. Yes. So much for uh, writing, uh, writing manual URLs. Um, Oh, that's interesting. So docsrs does not build with a nightly that's new enough to have this feature. So that's a little bit annoying. Um, although I think that's something that they're working on. Uh, owner, isn't it? Owner. I think it's owner. Oh, sorry. owner. Um, Yeah, they're building on a pretty old version. Um, so this is a little bit sad, but it's something that will be automatically fixed once these uh, doc links. Well, actually, I guess you'd have to trigger a rebuild. It's fine though, like it looking like this is a little bit annoying, but I think it's fine for now. Um, let's see, hey, it passed. Did it pass all of them? Did not pass on beta. Ooh. Well, that's interesting. Connection reset by peer. Huh. But I'm on nightly. Hmm. I feel like this is a lie. Called unwrap, you say? What? Wait, really on beta and nightly, but not on stable. What is this? Um, I don't quite see why that test would fail. Let's do uh, doesn't seem to be failing for me. Travis, what are you doing? I have noticed that sometimes um, the Travis network in particular, but but the Travis machines in general are somewhat slower than local machines and therefore trigger like more weird corner cases and race conditions in the code. So that could be what's happening here, but I'm not sure I believe that this is actually a bug. Maybe they like don't allow you to connect, but I don't know. Oh, it's reliable too. Really? All right. What if we do cargo beta test? Just up install beta. I don't even have beta installed. What is this? I feel like beta is one of those things that is only really used for continuous integration testing and very few people use it in practice. Um, although like in a sense, that's I guess what it's for is to catch bugs in CI. Um, let's see, what else? So the docs are now pretty nice. Oh, this is neat. I haven't seen that before. Another question is whether this method should really be called for each, but it seems like a relatively unimportant point. Why is it taking forever to download that? Well, I guess we can do uh, um, let's see, debug minion, and then do a cargo test again. I 
wonder why does this not work on Travis? Hmm. Specifically, it fails on cancel, but it doesn't tell me where. Can I set like um? Oh, I guess I can set Rust backtrace here, right? Rust backtrace one. Add, and then go back and rebuild this guy. Wow, it's taking a really long time. Um, well, so one question is, do we think there are more things that should be added to this? So certainly the crate level docs could use some more love. Um, but I think the example is actually fairly useful in this case. Um, let's see. Um, no, I think we're pretty much good. Um, I wanted to keep this stream a little bit shorter than the other ones, in part because we were doing something end to end. Um, and so it's nice for that not to be like five hours long. Um, and in part because I know that a five hour long live stream is a, a bit on the long side for both you and for me. Mm. <laughs> um, so I think once we have this working, we're pretty much good for the day, unless you guys have something in particular you want to see. I'm also happy to like talk about Rust things if you have questions. Come now, come now, Travis. All right, where did it fail? So it, no, oh, stop falling. Stop, ah, Travis, stop, there we go. Um, I failed at lib 251. Well, that's pretty unhelpful, 280. Huh. Oh, I bet you I know what this is. On Travis. Oh, that's awkward. So, um, remember how the, the way the way our cancellation works, uh, which window manager are you using? Uh, this is Xmonad. I'm not particularly tied to Xmonad. Um, I just wanted something that was tiling. I actually want to switch because Xmonad is not nice about integrating with like window events, um, but I don't have a good alternative to switch to yet. Um, but the like Xmonad is doing very little here apart from like managing workspaces and uh, uh, and like moving windows around. The bar at the bottom is Polybar, which I'm really happy with. Uh, okay, so sorry. So what I was saying was. Um, Remember how the way cancel works is that it ensures that for each will not be called again. And the reason we believe that we can connect again here is because um, uh, we know that once this connect finished, it enters the for each again, and then it tries to accept a new connection. However, there and therefore it should be blocking in accept. There are some cases under which accept will return early without there being anything to to do, um, and this happens, for example, if we look at um, list accept. Oh, that's totally what's happening. That's a little bit annoying. Um, so if you look at accept, ooh, why is this being unhelpful? Uh, accept. So see how it returns a, an IO result like everything else? If we look at the error you get here, the thing to look for, so there's a, where's error kind specifically. Um, there's this uh, interrupted. So interrupted will happen if, for example, the process receives a signal. Um, then usually if you get back interrupted, what, what you end up doing is you try again. 
but then the accept did return. Although in our case, that should be an error. But I bet you what happens here is really that the for each, the for each gets an interrupt. So I think here we want a uh, match. Oh, it's going to be a little awkward. Um, but if this is an OK stream, then we want to return the stream. So if you get the interrupted error, then of course you'll go through for each again, or rather you'll return an error, but because the error is only returned when you wait, we don't get to see what that error is. And my guess is it's interrupted. Um, instead, this connect just fails because the server has gone away. And so here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that if we get a stream and we return that stream, um, if we get an error uh, e, where e dot kind is io, error kind interrupted, then we uh, return OK loop state continue. So we basically say like, if you get interrupted, then just try to accept another connection. Um, and if you get an, an actual error of any other kind, then you return that error. Uh, Cargo format. Now let's see if we, okay, so this test still passes locally because nothing has really changed, but the, the thing that has changed is for Travis now is, so usually when you run things on, uh, whether it's Travis or in any other kind of stuff that's not running on pure hardware, you can get these kind of interruptions for all sorts of reasons, like the VM got interrupted or something. And so these interrupted signals are actually a lot more frequent when you run um, uh, sort of in the cloud. Um, and that's why I think we don't have to handle this locally because the the process just isn't getting interrupted. There's nothing to interrupt the system call. Whereas when we're running on Travis, there totally is. Uh, and here, when we get interrupted, what that really means is like, try again. Um, and that is what we're gonna do. So uh, try again if interrupted. And my guess is that this will fix our issue. Build history. Try again if interrupted. Let's see what this gives. I guess let's follow beta. It's a little sad that it has to reinstall Rust each time. I feel like the cache should be better about this. I wonder why stable worked though. Maybe we just got really lucky that it didn't get interrupted. Because I don't think this sh this shouldn't be any more or less prevalent on any of the release channels. Come on! No! <sighs> Why? Why, why, why? Yeah. Uh, huh. Wait, 286. All right. Uh, well, that's awkward. I guess the thing to try next is just make sure that we um, um, here we're just gonna like e print line or we're just gonna panic with the error. Great. In fact, we're going to do this. Uh, force errors to be visible on Travis. Hmm. It's a bit of a mystery. 
Let's see what this gives us. And specifically, why did the previous one succeed on stable as well? It succeeded on stable and on nightly. Okay, so that to me suggests that it is inter interrupted did help, it just didn't help enough. So there's some other error kind too. Um, I am not uh, related to or working on Redux. Um, I think Redux is really cool, but unfortunately uh, it's not something I'm currently working on. Um, uh, it It is something that would be fun, but it's also somewhat different to what I do, even though you're right that I'm in a, I'm, I am in an OS lab at MIT, but it's, I don't personally do a lot of OS stuff. I do have a lab mate who, um, who's building um, an operating system in Go, which is pretty cool. Uh... What? So it didn't panic. The server didn't panic, that is. The server just like... Ah, connection reset by peer. Yeah, so now stable and beta failed. Okay, so this is just some kind of fluke. Hmm. Travis connection reset by peer. This seems weird. I feel like this is a Travis issue. Uh. Disable ECN. Well, that seems, uh, <laughs> this seems like a very weird thing. I mean, yeah, you're, you're not wrong. I feel like this shouldn't matter. I sort of don't want to do this, but, uh, localhost. Shouldn't matter for localhost. Uh. Duplicate of 9,000. Hmm. Well, in that case, I don't know what we do. So this is, um, so, so here's what's annoying about this. Uh, this code is right. Um, it is true though that the, uh, Basically, what it's telling me is that um, this connect fails, but none of the previous ones. And it's always the one after canceling. Oh, I'm stupid. Uh, okay, so here's what's going on. Um, we are now handling interrupted, but all that means is if we get interrupted, then we won't crash. We won't return an error. We'll, but for each, like the loop will continue, which means that if we get interrupted, for each would have been called again, which means the cancel would cancel it. Um, and so this won't actually do anything. Uh, so, so, so specifically, if you call cancel and accept as interrupted, then it would have to call for each again, but you've canceled, so it won't. And so therefore, sometimes on Travis, when you get interrupted, the cancel will indeed succeed. And so here, we will do something like, uh, succeeded is zero. Uh, note that it may terminate early if the sys if accept gets interrupted. So what we're going to do is while this, I guess we're going to have 
connect assert is going to return a B. Um, so we're going to have, we're going to match on this. And we're going to say, um, if it's okay, if you get a mute, if you get a stream, then do what you used to do. If you get an error, then return the option IO error, then return the error. And now here we're gonna assert eek that none, which I think I'm allowed to do. Oh, two no, okay. uh, dot is none succeeded plus equals one. So we're basically gonna keep trying to connect until it fails to connect anymore. And then we're gonna here assert that uh, succeeded is less than two, less than or equal to one. So you should succeed at most once in connecting, right? Because if you succeeded once, you know that for each will have to be called again and then it definitely should cancel. Um, and so here, and we want this to sort inside the while loop because otherwise the while loop might just keep going. Um, if we, if like cancel was broken, for example. Uh, can I find value C? Ooh, can I do this? I think I can do this now. Um, I guess this is gonna be C. Um, If let error B is that, then return some B. And I'm not allowed to assert eek none because IO error does not implement debug, which is, oh, partial eek. Well, so we're gonna do this dot, actually, no, we're just gonna do unwrap or no what's the what's the best way to assert that an option is none and print it if it is some it should just be asserting none but i'm not allowed to do that so i guess i will just assert that this dot is none basically that there was no error uh, and we will do the same here great um so i don't know if you realize what the change i made here was but the idea is that um Connect assert will now try to connect, and if it's successfully um, if it's successfully connected, it will assert that it got it gets the right uh, string back. Um, if on the other hand it errors for some reason, it will return what that error was. Um, and in the case of canceling, what we want to do is make sure that at most one connect succeeds after we cancel, and after that the server should have gone away because we've told it to cancel, right? And that's what this now does, and this handles the the case where Travis will end early because it gets interrupted um, because the interrupt will cause the service to shut down basically immediately after we call cancel, which means that this loop will fail to connect even once. And so therefore succeeded will be one, which is less than or equal to, the succeeded will be zero, which is less than or equal to one. This loop will, will not hit anything. Um, and so we're all good. So now let's try to push this. So, uh, handle um, tests should pass if accept is interrupted. Push. How about now, Travis? Did I make you happy now? Uh, Travis, build history. Who has faith? Who thinks it will work? I think it'll work. I'm like 75% sure that it'll work. Uh, I am using Xmonad. 
Although you can't actually tell what min window manager I'm using because the window manager is using, doing basically nothing, which is how I want it to be. Um, the window manager is a, it's like a tiling window manager. So if I open something else here, it does this. Um, and then I can like switch around windows, I can move between workspaces, and that's really all the features that I want. Um, and Xmonad gives me this, but I would happily switch. The um, terminal is Alacrity, which is written in Rust and actually really nice. I've been really happy with it. And the bar at the bottom is um, Polybar, which I've also been really happy with. All the configs are at um, here. Um, should arguably clean this up and document them, but but yeah, this has all the configurations for polybar and such, if you're interested. All right, let's see, Travis. Build four. Hey, it all passed. All right, so in theory, that should mean that this turns green, and that should mean that this turns green. Fantastic. We did it. We did it, team. We now have a crate. It has been documented, it is tested, and it is published and does what it should. Uh, yeah, this is Alacrity. My uh, Alacrity config is also in the repo. Um, and the font, I'm actually a little bit sad about because it's recently gotten a lot worse, but it's um, Noto from Google. Um, it used to be a lot nicer, and then there was a, an update they pushed a while ago, which made it worse. So I might consider switching again if I don't get used to it. I feel like the, I like I want it to not have serifs and because serifs and monophones are a little bit weird, but it's hard to work around. Um, well, I think that's sort of all I wanted to cover today. Um, if you have other questions about the crate or other things you think we should do, then let me know. Um, preferably like now-ish. It's a little bit hard to let me know after the fact. Mm. I'll, um, I think these sort of shorter form, I mean, it's still almost three hours, but um, these shorter form uh, live streams work really well for smaller projects like this. So I want to also do one on um, some kind of data structure because I think that would be interesting to watch too. Um, if you have like feedback on the stream or if you have ideas for things I should cover or um, like I've been thinking of doing a series where we investigate the standard library or try to implement things that are in the standard library like hash maps or mutexes. Um, I think that could be really interesting. Then um, just ping me on Twitter or uh, my Patreon as well. I'm like, I follow that as well. You don't actually have to support me if you don't want to, but it's a nice way to keep up with what's happening. Um, I will record um i'll post the re the recording of the stream as well on youtube as usual and add it to the normal channels um and yeah um feel free to reach out if you have other questions or ideas um thanks for joining me i guess if there are no more questions then uh i think we'll end it there bye everyone it was uh another great stream I'm uh, glad to have you all with me, um, and uh, come back next time. Ooh. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>